Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning, everybody. It is my very great pleasure to welcome Mr. Yun, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, as our special guest today. Um, I do remember, Mr. Minister, the last time we met in a restaurant in Seoul during a freezing cold uh, winter day, just a few days prior to you becoming Foreign Minister. I was very grateful for that meeting, and I took the opportunity then to invite you to come to uh, IPI once you were appointed Foreign Minister. As all good politicians, you expressed gratitude, but remained diplomatically non-committal since you were not yet appointed. But I knew I would see you very soon in New York. And I am indeed delighted to have the honor to now officially congratulate you on your appointment and welcome you to IPI and to New York today. But before I begin, on a more somber note, I would like to offer my deepest condolences for the tragic loss of life, and so many of them young lives, caused by the recent uh, ferry disaster in your country. And I know I speak for everybody in this room today when I say that we join you in mourning and share in your national sorrow. Today, we are truly honored to have you here with us on this spring afternoon, in spite of your very busy schedule, which you have shared with me earlier this morning. Mr. Yun has a distinguished background in global politics. This was recognized last year when he was named one of the, of the world's uh, 500 most powerful people by Foreign Policy magazine. He has served in a number of important posts, both at home and abroad, including as Deputy Foreign Minister, Deputy Director General for North American Affairs, and Minister at the Korean Embassy in Washington, D.C., as well as the Korean Permanent Mission to the United Nations in Geneva. And from 2006 to 2008, Mr. Yun served as the Senior Presidential Secretary for Foreign Security and Unification Policy. Impressively, he also spent three years as a professor, teaching at the Graduate School of International Studies at Sogang University in Korea. He has an impressive academic background, including a law degree from the Graduate School of Law at Seoul National University, and a master's degree from the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in the United States. Since the Republic of Korea joined the United Nations in 1991, it has played an ever more active role in international affairs, acting both as a regional facilitator and an influential international actor. In recent times, South Korea has taken a lead on the global stage as a member of both international and regional organizations, including WTO, OECD, the ASEAN, plus three, the East Asia Summit, as well as the G20. It is also a founding member of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation and the East Asia Summit. And of course, South Korea leads the UN today actually in two ways. It has both the Secretary General, but also we are sitting here with the President of the Security Council. Uh, and I can't resist to tell you that uh, I will have to leave here together with the, the Korean ambassador who is presiding with the council today because uh, I am in my um, other professional role as a, a UN Special Envoy for Issues in Lebanon presenting the Secretary General's report, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, to the ambassador of uh, South Korea and the rest of the Security Council. So we have to leave together. Uh, this afternoon, we are very much looking forward to hearing your views, Mr. Minister, concerning regional cooperation and multilateral diplomacy. We also look forward to hearing about the challenges and the possibilities of the peaceful reunification of South and North Korea. I will now refrain from speaking any further and let our distinguished guest elaborate on this uh, important issue. Before we start, however, 
May I ask everyone to please silence your phones. Excellency, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, Frederick Larson, High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, Angela Kane, Excellencies, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank Frederick Larson for having me here at this gathering organized by this prestigious IPI, and also I wish to thank for the, your expression of condolences to the victims of the uh, latest uh, ferry tragedy and to their families as well. Next year, we will celebrate the 70th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. However, uh, this will also mark the 70th year of the Division for Koreans, who have a long history as one united people. Founded under the auspices of the UN in 1948, the fledgling republic immediately fell to the victim of the Cold War power politics, hampered in its determination to join this global body. Thus, my country became a latecomer to the United Nations, having gained its membership only in 1991. The two Koreas became the 160s and 161st members of this organization, along with three Baltic states. As a diplomat posted to then Korea's observed mission to the UN, I still have vivid memories of listening to the admission speech that the then for Korean Foreign Minister delivered at the United Nations headquarters in September 1991. The hard reality of the Cold War dictated Korea and its people to wait for more than four decades to move from the observer seat to the member seat that was just a few meters apart. For many Koreans, that was a somber reminder of the power politics of the international relations. Knowing that the, the, two, the two Germanys had replaced their two separate name plates, name plates to one Germany just one year before, it was with a heavy heart that I had to witness the admission of two Koreas to the UN instead of one. Now, 23 years later, Korea is a member of the UN Security Council for the second time. Korea is playing an active role in all three major councils of the United Nations, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, and the Human Rights Council. Tomorrow, I'll be presiding over a meeting of the Security Council on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of its resolution 1540. Korea is also participating in various activities, including peacekeeping operations, development cooperation, climate change, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and promotion of human rights, and among others. Most importantly, the current Secretary, Secretary General is a proud son of Korea, as you know. As if uh, we are to try to make up for this belated admission, we have certainly made astonishing strides over the last decade or so. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, during this time, the international community has also undergone great transformations. Interdependence deepened due to globalization, while insecurity, inequality, injustice, and intolerance also increased. At a time when we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda, we are bearing witness to conflicts around the globe, including those in Syria, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. Furthermore, the bottom billion, including countless women and children, still live, be still live below the extreme poverty line on less than $2 a day. As Secretary General Ban Ki-moon once said, the international community is confronted with an oversupply of problems and a deficit of solutions, which require more multilateral cooperation and partnerships than ever. Global challenges no longer affect just one or groups of countries. Indeed, today, they affect the entire international community, like the butterfly effect. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula are no exceptions 
to these complexities. The geopolitical plate of the region is going through what I would call tectonic shifts. Historical transformation is now taking place in Northeast Asia. We are witnessing a rising China, a resurgent Japan, an assertive Russia, and an anachronistic North Korea, who is, who is simultaneously pursuing nuclear weapons and economic development. On its part, the United States is now pivoting and rebalancing to Asia as well. Conflicts surrounding history, territory, and maritime security, among others, are raising the concern that even a military confrontation owing to any miscalculations may become a reality. In fact, Henry Kissinger, who I met yesterday, said at this year's Munich Security Conference that, quote, Asia is more in a position of 19th century Europe, where military conflict is not ruled out, unquote. On top of this, misguided nationalism is rearing its ugly head in the form of historical rev revisionism or even denialism, thereby prolonging the tension among countries in the region. Such political and security tensions are increasing despite the deepening economic interdependency, a phenomenon which I call the Asia paradox. At the heart of all these problems lies an ever-deepening trust deficit. There is no better visual illustration of, of such paradox than a satellite photo of the Korean Peninsula taken at night from space, which shows a striking contrast between the two Koreas. Clothed in darkness, the northern part of the peninsula looks like a black sea, whereas the southern part, glittering with bright lights, resembles an island in the middle of the sea. Alongside these vivid contrasts, we see all kinds of contradictions in North Korea. Such volatile situation in Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula is hampering the region's peace and prosperity. If the current situation persists unaddressed, it will undermine the very foundation of the flourishing Northeast Asian economy. Alexander the Great had cut up the Gordian knot with a single stroke. But unfortunately, we do not have such a solution to our present day problems. Ladies and gentlemen, the Park Geun-hye administration took office last year and amid these mounting challenges in the Korean Peninsula, Northeast Asia and beyond, President Park's foreign policy, which we call trust politic, is aimed to transform the existing structure of distrust and conflict into a structure of trust and cooperation. In essence, she is seeking to build a new Korean Peninsula, a new Northeast Asia, and a new world. The greatest obstacle to pursuing this audacious endeavor is the North Korean nuclear conundrum. In particular, the most urgent task is to prevent the North Korean from conducting another nuclear test and mastering its nuclear weapons and delivery capability. Over the last month or so, North Korea has been warning of an additional nuclear test to be conducted at an unimaginable scale. In fact, there have been a series of indications that preparations are underway in this regard. Whether North Korea will actually engage in such nuclear tests or not, our assessment is that North Korea is ready to undertake the test whenever they make the necessary political decision. Faced with such a challenge, my government is making intensive diplomatic efforts to deter North Korea's dangerous provocations. We are working in concert with our friends and partners in the region and around the world, such as parties to six-party nuclear talks, members, members of the UN Security Council, the EU, ASEAN, and the newly formed MICTA, composed of Mexico, Indonesia, Turkey, Australia, al along with South Korea. Furthermore, leaders of Korea, US and Japan, met at a trilateral summit at The Hague, and President Park Geun-hye also met with Chinese President Xi Jinping and American President Obama on separate occasions. 
During this series of summit meetings, the Chinese leadership had made it very clear that they will not accept a nuclear-armed North Korea and strongly oppose any further North Korean nuclear tests. President Obama, during his visit to Seoul, stated that in case of North Korea's additional nuclear test, he will, quote, look at additional ways to apply pressure on North Korea, further sanctions that have even more bite, unquote. If North Korea were to go ahead with another nuclear test in defiance of the collective will of the international community, it will have to pay the heaviest price that it has never been seen in the past. As all of us are well aware, the UN Security Council has already adopted a series of resolutions that impose extensive and strong sanctions against the North over its last three nuclear provocations. <clears throat> the additional sanctions that North Korea calls head of sanctions and so opposes should not only master the full weight of fortified UN sanctions, but will also trigger a wide range of individual sanctions. These actions will be an iron hat of unbearable weight. <laughs> Membership of the UN requires states to be peace-loving. Therefore, states pledge to peacefully abide by the obligations enshrined in the UN Charter. In this regard, the international community should send out a strong message that habitual disregard for the UN Charter will not go unpunished for the sake of its own credibility. North Korea must realize that it cannot breach its obligations without the total loss of trust and complete isolation from the international community. From our standpoint, the advanced level of North Korean nuclear programs has no comparison in terms of its seriousness. I wish to remind you that North Korea is the only country to have conducted nuclear weapons tests in the 21st century. <coughs> it is for this very reason that UN Security Council resolutions demand that North Korea dismantle its nuclear weapons programs in a complete, verifiable, and irreversible manner. As I speak before you now, the third preparatory committee for the 2015 MPT Review Conference is taking place here in New York. I call on states parties to the MPT to send a clear and firm message opposing North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons. Now, thus far, I have focused on the subject of nuclear proliferation emanating from North Korea. What is adding to our concern is that this kind of nuclear weapons program can fall into the wrong hands of terrorists and other non-state actors. Uh, this is why I attach great importance to tomorrow's high-level open debate of the Security Council, which I will preside over, to discuss ways to strengthen the implementation of Resolution 1540. Uh, this open debate is a very natural complement to the outcome of the Nuclear Security Summit held in The Hague last March, through which the international community forged its unified stance to prevent nuclear terrorism. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution of the UNESCO provides, quote, that since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed, unquote. However, the semblance of peace on the Korean Peninsula remains fragile. Uh, this is why my government is attaching great importance to building trust and achieving sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. The dire human rights and humanitarian situation in North Korea is also the area in which we wish to make progress. This is the main reason why President Park Geun-hye laid out her vision for a unified Korea during a speech in Dresden uh, last month. Through that speech, she proposed three concrete and action-oriented proposals to the North, to the North uh, that is to resolve the humanitarian problems of the people of the Korean Peninsula to build infrastructure for the welfare of the people and for co prosperity of the two Koreas, and to promote integration of the Korean people. President Park's vision for unification puts people first. Uh, this is in line with the UN's guiding principles as captured 
in the preamble of the UN Charter, which opened with the lines, we the peoples. Our humanitarian proposals can be steadily implemented regardless of political and security considerations, including through the 1,000-day UN project for maternal health and nutrition for infants. The situation of chronic malnutrition of infants is quite dire. These infants are compatriots who will live side by side us after the unification. But as the saying goes, it takes to tango. We hope that North Korea will positively respond to our genuine proposals. We recognize that our journey toward unification will be long and bumpy. As we saw in the case of German reunification, cooperation from the international community is essential in completing this journey. Uh, this is the reason why Korea's pursuit of unification will proceed in harmony with the interests of our, our neighbors, with the blessing of the international community, and will contribute to the cause of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, the unification that Korea aspires to build will be in the interest of both neighboring countries and the international community. Among other things, the Korean unification can make contributions in the following directions. First, the unification of Korea will serve as a significant stabilizer for the security of our region and beyond. Indeed, a unified Korea will be free of nuclear weapons, thus alleviating security threats in Northeast Asia. Furthermore, it will facilitate global efforts towards nuclear security, nuclear non-proliferation, and nuclear safety. Uh, this will in turn help to assure in a nuclear weapons-free world. As the reunification of Germany charted the path for the eventual integration of Europe, the Korean unification will contribute to the creation of a more cooperative order in Northeast Asia. Second positive aspect of the United Korea will be the immense economic benefits for its neighbors and the region. Just as the reunification of Germany paved the way for the miracle of Elbe River for the eastern part of Germany, I am certain that the unification of Korea will result in the miracle of Taedong River for the northern part of Korea in a follow-up to the miracle of the Han River in the latter half of the last century. The emergence of unified economy with a population of 80 million will present an enormous economic opportunity and provide a new blue ocean for its neighbors and partners by transforming the peninsula into a Pacific and Eurasian hub. Third, the unification of Korea will make significant contributions to addressing the global agendas. More than anything else, the entire peninsula will enjoy such universal values as individual freedom and human rights. A unified Korea with enhanced status and capacity will be better placed to address the daunting array of global challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, this year marks the 120th anniversary of Korea's first experiment at Western-style reform which took place during the height of imperialism of the late 19th century. Sadly, the reform failed and led to the loss of Korea's sovereignty. Furthermore, the loss of statehood led to the division of the peninsula and the tragic civil war. Throughout our history, we learned the important lessons, hard lessons, that if you are unprepared for historical ties that came to your shore, it is not just you, but your future generations who will bear the cost of your wrong choice. As Korea has now grown into a responsible member of the international community, we are poised to open a better future and write a new chapter of history. As Peter Drucker said, quote, the best way to predict the future is to create it, unquote. Korea will not wait for changes, we will create changes. The most important change that we wish to create is the unification of Korea, as I said. It will mark a significant progress in humanity's march toward greater peace, prosperity, and justice, as enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. 
the unification of Korea will also facilitate the journey of the United Nations to become a true parliament of man, where peace, development, and human rights are pursued. 23 years ago, the two Germanys ended their long-standing division and replaced their two nameplates in the UN with one. Likewise, I do believe the day is approaching, perhaps much faster than we may all realize, for the two Koreas to replace their respective nameplates with one singular nameplate that simply says Korea. On this historic journey toward unification, I wish to count on the support of the United Nations and its member states like you. Thank you very much. Terrific, and thank you very much for giving us this uh, tour d'horizon over the uh, political uh, uh, landscape uh, of your region. Terrific and very candid. Before I open the floor, um, may I ask you uh, a couple of questions concerning your neighbor in the north. Uh, is it so that over the last year or so that there has been a move of power away from the party to the military? Uh, and that many who were considered, in relative term, pragmatists um, and more moderate have been uh, moved aside, uh, both politically and some physically, uh, and that, or, uh, uh, so that the um, power uh, centre is now more on the military side, which is more aggressive than it was in the balance between party and, and, uh, and military earlier, so these are two questions. The last question is, um, is the leader in command of the military or the military in command of the leader? Yes. <clears throat> you know, since the uh, previous leader, Kim Jong-un, was in reign in charge, North Korea has maintained a policy of military first policy. Under that policy, military it prevails over the party, unlike the other communist system. But now, almost at the end of this uh, previous leader's reign, he wanted to change that system, uh, reverting the, to the traditional communist system. That means a party should prevail over the military. So he made some reforms. But because of his sudden death, he was not able to complete his reform. Now, since the new, uh, new leader, young leader, came to power, he introduced a series of uh, measures, very radical measures. As you know, for the last uh, one year and, uh, and a half, he reshuffled four defense ministers. Can you imagine? Within 15 months or 16 months, there are four or five defense ministers. That means even this military uh, are really uh, not in charge of the uh, government, the, the country. Uh, so. Uh, de facto number two man uh, for the last several de decades was, ex was executed very brutally November last year uh, through the instruction of this young leader. So uh, now there is no real meaning or significance that we uh, divide. Uh, we have this uh, delineation of uh, the military and the party because there is only one uh, leader who is in charge officially and virtually, uh, but uh, now uh, we have to see how uh, the North Korean uh, the power politics will evolve in the coming uh, months and uh, years, uh, because still the situation in North Korea is very fluid and quite unstable, unpredictable. Uh, so uh, this is rather they are becoming a more one-man rule state uh, without uh, any real counsel from uh, senior power elites. So uh, now there are uh, less influence on the part of the senior uh, politicians, uh, senior military members. Now all those influences are now seems to be going to the rather younger, younger elites, elites of the party and of the military and other uh, hierarchies. Uh, now, as I said, uh, the second, uh, the answer to your second question is that yes, it is the Kim Jong Un, the young leader who is uh, in charge of the country and the party and the military, uh, rather than uh, the other way around. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, still, 
there are many uh, unusual developments are taking place, so we have to uh, see very closely what eventually uh, all these measures will uh, lead to. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, not very encouraging but very enlightening words. May I now open the, open the floor? Uh, I go to the left-hand side there. Can you provide a mic? And please state your name and affiliation before you speak, even if everybody knows you. Thank you very much, Mr. Foreign Minister Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Um, you said that if North Korea does conduct a nuclear test, um, it will see pay the heaviest price ever seen. I wonder if you could elaborate on that and <laughs> say what you would expect that price to be. And also, at the end of your speech, uh, you said that perhaps um, we would be surprised at the uh, faster pace of uh, Korean unification. Um, why did you say that? What gives you that kind of encouragement? Okay. I thought actually I should collect a few questions, but then, since there were so many questions there, and so provocative questions, I think I will give the minister the floor immediately. Well, it's not provocative. It's a very, very important question. Actually, uh, the reason why I use the heaviest price uh, is that, uh, you know, even though uh, we adopted uh, a four important Security Council resolutions, still there are some uh, weak links, weak points, or maybe even loopholes that North Korea could evade. Uh, so this time around, if they, uh, if they really defy the, uh, the request of the international community, uh, the members of the UN Security Council, uh, together with uh, many partners around the globe, have to feel all these uh, loopholes, right? Uh, multilaterally or individually. And also, we all are aware of the significance of this additional testing. We are not expecting to see fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh testing. First testing uh, will uh, make a great impact of the strategic landscape in our part of the world, even that will undermine the foundation of NPT. So this is why we have to be united once and for all to deter this test first. But if that deterrence fails, then Security Council as well as the international community should be united to respond very firmly uh, to this uh, disregard of the obligation, international obligations. And also, uh, why I'm rather uh, the, uh, optimistic about this unification in terms of timing. Well, you know, as you recall, even uh, many German leaders, West German leaders, were not able to predict uh, their ultimate unification will come that soon, even after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. So uh, we see uh, many indications that uh, there are more benign, uh, favorable environment that is unfolding surrounding the peninsula. There are some changes inside North Korea. There are many changes outside the Korean peninsula. For example, now even China and Russia are now publicly saying that they are in favor of peaceful unification of two Koreas. Before, it has been a taboo that we are talking about unification with our neighbors. But now, it's no, it's no longer taboo. We are publicly talking about this important unification. We believe that the United Korea will be interest of uh, uh, the China. I think uh, the continued provocation on the part of North Korea will be uh, rather a liability for China, not an asset. So the same goes for Russia. Uh, so we believe that, uh, I believe that uh, we have to be prepared for any uh, possibility. Whether the unification will be realized sooner or later, we have to be prepared for that uh, possibility and for any scenario that will be unfolding in the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, I see now many, many hands here who wants to participate in the privilege of having a dialogue with you. So can I move to the second person on the second row? 
<clears throat> Thank you. I'm Nicola Lambertini, Italian DPR. W one question. The day that hopefully your country will be reunified, how different you will found the northern part of the peninsula? I mean, it's not only in economic terms, but also culturally, relations with power, and so on and so on. I say this because we, as Italians, we reunified our country one century and a half ago, and we still have strong difference among the northern south part of the peninsula. Thank you. Shall we take uh, one or two more questions? I see a hand over there, the lady there on the one, two, three, fourth row. Thank you. I'm Cora Weiss from the International Peace Bureau. I loved your reference to dancing the tango, and I wonder if uh, your head of state, if Mrs. Park, would offer a question to the North to ask them what their three proposals for reunification would be, or do you have another possible way to start the tango? Then I will go to the person there with the glasses who's raising his hand on the other side there. Thanks, I'm, I'm Lee Siegel. I work at the Social Science Research Council in New York. Uh, Mr. Minister, I, I heard you use the word peace, which seems to be an appropriate word in the International Peace Institute. But I haven't heard you or the president or anybody in the administration talk about a willingness to conclude a peace treaty with North Korea. Are, are you prepared to do that? Is that what you mean by peace? I will turn over okay. to you again. Okay. All right. All very important question again. Uh, on the first question, as things stand now, the North Korea's uh, GDP is only, uh, North Korea's power is only one fortieth of that of South Korea in terms of uh, population and in terms of the total GDP. Uh, so that means that uh, the, uh, compared with the uh, German unification, the uh, environment or conditions for unification for both Koreas will be much more difficult, much tougher. Uh, so uh, that means we have to be uh, spend uh, more time and energy in the lead up to unification as well as in the wake of the unification to fill the gap between the two sides in terms of economy, in terms of social differences or social disparities, like we have seen in, uh, uh, in two Germanys. But uh, in the case of uh, this uh, power uh, inside and outside, that will be a, a rather a dif different problems uh, because uh, one big trouble we are facing now is this uh, loose, uh, 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 loss of uh, the uh, uh, homo homogeneity. Already for the last several decades, uh, even though we are using the same language, but uh, they are more, North Korean uh, competitors are more familiar with the uh, North Korean system, uh, more indoctrinated. They are not familiar with the Western way of uh, human rights and uh, you know, the uh, other good things. So how to introduce this uh, winds of uh, change in North Korea and uh, gradually expose them to this uh, uh, South Korean style or Western style uh, living standards, uh, that would be a huge task for us or challenge for us. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, now I hear when I visited uh, Germany just uh, one month ago, I was told that uh, even uh, United Germany uh, took uh, almost two decades to uh, end the, all the uh, social subsidies to uh, former East Germany. That was only this year, I was told. That means even for the country of strong economy like East, uh, former Germany, uh, uh, spent that, uh, period, uh, that uh, amount of time, then uh, 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 perhaps South Korea, we have to spend uh, much time to feel the difference or gap between the two Koreas as we have now. But what is more important is that uh, division cost is much higher than unification cost. This is the starting point for us. Uh, many people in South Korea used to say that, well, division cost is too high, so we should be uh, rather go slower, go slower than uh, faster. But I think this is a wrong premise. Uh, my government under President Park is now uh, trying to uh, introduce uh, this idea to, especially to our young people who are 
uh, not very well aware of the tragedy of the Korean War and the, the cost of the division. So this is why my president uh, made a big speech in Dresden. And uh, regarding uh, another tango, yes, uh, basically uh, South Korea, my country, is almost always uh, very open to the dialogue or any proposal uh, coming from North Korea. Uh, as far as it is genuine, uh, right now, uh, for any uh, unification talks to be meaningful, uh, there are some uh, something that should be done in advance. That is kind of uh, accumulation of uh, uh, building trust, trust building. Uh, because of this uh, series of provocations, confrontations we have seen over the last several decades, especially over the recent years, uh, there is a very strong, very deep trust deficit between the two Koreas. Even now, we are faced with a series of provocations starting from early February, the launching of a Scud missile, launching of uh, you know, uh, uh, artillery shells, and uh, now they are talking about uh, medium-range missile testing, talking of, talk about this additional nuclear test. And uh, even they said uh, they'll attack South Korea at an unimaginable, with an unimaginable kind of uh, you know, a method. So this is very you know, threatening. So how can we uh, have very serious talks of, talk about uh, unification formula or unification policy uh, to have a nice tango together? Uh, so we need some kind of atmosphere to enable uh, two sides to enjoy tango in a very peaceful, friendly manner. And on peace treaty, yes, uh, if you read the, uh, the September, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the statement of 2005, which were agreed upon among the six parties, six party nuclear talks, we are supposed to proceed in that direction. But there is one uh, precondition, that means there should, a, there should be a significant progress in denuclearization efforts. Then we are supposed to, uh, we are ready to discuss peace regime. But peace regime format is different from six party format because the parties to the Korean armistice is uh, South and North Korea, China and the United States. So it should be the same uh, members of the six party talks. But if we are uh, if we wish to talk about peace treaty, usually, uh, according to the conventional, you know, uh, the uh, theories or the, our uh, precedents, we know that uh, we should start from CBMs or CSBMs, right? And uh, there is a long series of pre steps that should, that uh, we, uh, we we we, honest, uh, we intensely talk about this peace treaty. So we should not put the cart before the horse. First things should come first, rather than uh, later things should come first. So this is our approach. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Um, very illuminating. Uh, I see one hand here on the first row, the first row. If you could please get a microphone. And thank you, Minister, for your beautiful, you know, this uh, statement. Could you, you see, I'm from Bangladesh. I'm PR of Bangladesh. And Bangladesh believes that all violence, misunderstanding, war emanate from a mindset of intolerance, from a mindset of hatred. We also believe that if you would like to have sustainable peace and stability, then we have to create a mindset of tolerance, a mindset of respect for others. Now, are South Korea is doing anything to inculcate a mindset of tolerance and respect f among these Koreans. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And then I see a hand at the very end of the room. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I'm uh, Peter Ilyich of DPR of Russia. Uh, in your opening statement, you referred to four party talks that uh, President Park had in uh, The Hague. What is your prospects for uh, real for full six-party talks, and what kind of action each party sh should done that uh, should facilitate six-party talks? Thank you. Admirably short question and intervention. Uh, I will take then a few more. 
we have about 25 minutes left. Um, the gentleman in the front there w without tie, yes. Sorry about that. Um, you have to state your name. Benny Avni with Newsweek in New York Post. Um, the, it, it's usually said that uh, the only entity with power over North Korea is China. Is it still true in the age of uh, Kim Jong-un? Are they losing uh, their influence over Pyongyang? Again, admirably short and precise. Uh, there is uh, a, a lady at the, uh, behind Benny there. Yep. Hello, I'm Carolyn Schwager. I'm the Deputy PR at the New Zealand Mission here to the UN. Um, you mentioned, Minister, in your uh, address the important role the international community can play in terms of engaging North Korea um, to improve the atmospherics, I guess. Um, so can you please tell us what can we do um, and the rest of the international community to help fill that trust deficit that you spoke about? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then one last question in this round. There's also a lady at the back there. I'm Harriet Mandel, uh, founder and director of the Global Roundtable. Uh, Mr. Minister, um, would you have any comments on Japan and what the potential of Japan's role at all in the issues that confront uh, the two Koreas have? Thank you. Thank you. Then I will turn the floor to you again, Mr. Minister. Okay. Uh, regarding this, uh, our regarding the question from our, our Bangladesh colleague, yes, uh, actually this is the reason why I quoted this uh, preamble of the UNESCO that uh, the, the war comes from the mindset of the people. Uh, so, in the same way, uh, uh, my government uh, uh, has, been, has been maintaining that uh, uh, the dialogue is very important element uh, to ease tension and build trust on the Korean Peninsula. So uh, to overcome this 40-year-long uh, uh, 40 or 70-year-long division on the peninsula, uh, we have to ease hatred vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis each other. Uh, so I understand, uh, I, I recognize the importance of your points. Uh, this is why uh, over the last several decades, uh, previous uh, administrations in Korea sometimes adopted what called sunshine policy or sometimes hardline policy, and the current administration policy is kind of a uh, uh, you know, combined policy, uh, drawing on all the strengths of the each administration in the past uh, to uh, ease the weakness of those approaches. So inculcation of this uh, mindset uh, for intolerance, uh, I mean the tolerance and understanding uh, will be one important element in our, our current approach and future approach. Uh, so. On that, uh, there is no doubt. But the hard reality sometimes uh, actually moving against our wishes and our stance. So, uh, especially uh, when your partner, your partner uh, is behaving in a totally different way, right? Then that is the biggest difficulty. And then uh, uh, the the uh, prospect of six-party talks. Uh, well, for the last five years, there has been no single meeting of six-party talks, official meeting of six-party talks. So some people, uh, you know, uh, calls that uh, calls six-party talks uh, already, already dead or dormant. But uh, for all six-party members, from the standpoint of six-party, still we see some merits of these six-party talks because. Uh, we have very good uh, agreement on this understanding in 2005. There, are, uh, there is a certain roadmap there, which are still useful, and uh, give us some uh, uh, very good, nice inspiration for moving forward. forward. Uh, the problem is that, fundamentally, compared with the previous years, North Korea has a different approach. That is, they are now providing that North Korea is a nuclear weapon state in their constitution. They, they have a domestic law to implement that provision of the constitution. And now uh, they are saying that uh, challenging, uh, uh, challenging to this notion of simultaneous pursuit of nuclear weapons and economic development from anybody, anybody will be denying uh, the regime, uh, rationale of regime. So uh, they are very sensitive to uh, any challenge on this 
uh, the nuclear weapon state notion. So th that is fundamental problem. So under these circumstances, actually, uh, all of our six party members are working very hard, especially over the last several months, to resume the talks. But the, some, there are some differences. One side is wants to lower the bar for the resumption of the talks. And the other side is very much eager to uh, raise the bar because North Korea already violated all these important violations. So we cannot take a business as usual approach. So the latter part uh, is almost uh, taken, by, usually taken by the US, Japan, and South Korea. And, but uh, this time, if uh, North Korea again resorts to additional nuclear testing, then you should ask yourself whether we should lower the bar or uh, raise the bar. That is very simple. And uh, the influence of China vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea, especially under the young leader, uh, many countries uh, in the region uh, are, still, are still believing that uh, China uh, still has the most influence over North Korea in many ways, especially its economic influence over North Korea. They are providing most of uh, energy and food assistance to North Korea still. But North Korea is a very you know, independent nation, very tenacious, uh, very proud. And they don't like uh, big, uh, big country power, big powers. So that does mean that uh, even, uh, f uh, even a big country like uh, China or Russia uh, feel some limit to impose their wills on North Korea. So this is the reality. But still, uh, this young leader is, uh, is now at the very early stage of his reign. So he needs a kind of backing or support from uh, North Korean neighbors or, or their friends, international community, uh, for the legitimacy for the legitimacy of his uh, its regime or for the support of, for the support of his economy. So somehow uh, they have to continue, uh, you know, seek support from China and other neighbors, like uh, you know, for example, Southeast Asia or even European Union. EU is now providing some humanitarian assistance to North Korea, training some North Korean officials in their capitals, right? So I think uh, uh, this, uh, this is uh, uh, naturally uh, uh, leading to the next question from our New Zealand colleague, how international community can help South Korea in uh, the approach to easing tension and uh, building trust uh, to feel this, uh, uh, to avoid this trust deficit. Uh, basically, uh, each of our friends or partners can do its own role in its own way. For example, as EU has, is doing, uh, you can uh, train North Korean uh, officials in your capitals, uh, introducing Western way of uh, you know, management uh, or whatever. And uh, also, there are some countries uh, who wish to have a human rights dialogue with North Korea, right? The highlighting the importance of human rights especially in the wake of this important report uh, by the COI, Commission of Inquiry, uh, presented by this uh, Australian judge, Mr. Kirby. Very eloquent historical document, very voluminous report. So uh, this is another way of uh, our colleagues from the internet community can, uh, expose, can expose North Korea to the, real, the reality of the international community. And then uh, finally, uh, the toughest question what kind of role uh, Japan should play, especially uh, now and in the future. As you know, the, uh, um, uh, uh, some neighbors of Japan are going through uh, having a very difficult uh, time with Japan, uh, mostly because of the uh, uh, issues uh, relating to history, right? And uh, so, uh, for example, now Seoul has very difficult time with Tokyo over enforce the sexual slavery issue called the comfort women or, or the issue of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the visit of uh, Japanese political leaders to uh, shrine, Yasukuri shrine, which beautifies and justifies the aggression during the Pacific War. So all these things uh, requires uh, that uh, first, if we, have, uh, if, we uh, if we wish to have uh, real progress in our relations, uh, we need to see some kind of sincere efforts on the part of uh, uh, political leaders of Japan 
on the past history, like uh, Germans, uh, like Germans did in the past. They should make a clean break with the past. I still remember that the historic scene uh, when uh, Billy Brandt nailed down in a cemetery in Poland to re uh, show remorse of the, what the Nazis done, have done in the past. So we wish to see uh, uh, some, uh, this, some kind of very sincere gestures. We wish to see the, the words be translated into actions. Uh, so uh, we'll be uh, watching very closely what uh, our uh, Japanese colleagues will be doing in the coming weeks and months. I think I have, I have answered most of the question. I think we can then, th thank you so much once again. I think we can do one more round of questions. I saw still some hands and uh, uh, I don't uh, want anybody to, uh, uh, not to have the privilege of having a dialogue with you. Can I go to the gentleman right there? Thank you, thank you for If you can state your name and affiliation. Alexander Ilichev, senior officer with the Department of Political Affairs across the street. Um, Ambassador, thank you for being able to convince the minister uh, to come here today for two reasons. One is the Republic of Korea is uh, uh, one of the quickly emerging global leaders. And number two, because uh, this rise is spearheaded by a very constructive, dynamic, and focused foreign policy that uh, uh, the foreign minister personifies. Uh, Excellency, you mentioned uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. And uh, he is the source of pride uh, for Koreans, uh, not only in your country, but also in the North and overseas. Uh, it's a well-known fact. Uh, is there any way for the Secretary General and the rest of us in the Secretariat and maybe the UN system as a whole to be more effective in providing support to your efforts to resolve the nuclear issue, promote inter-Korean mm -hmm. cooperation, and bringing durable peace on the peninsula? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the lady over there. Uh, uh, okay, since we, we have the microphone, let's start with Angela, and then we move to you. Thank okay, you. Uh, thank uh, you. You will get the next turn. Am I? Am I? Okay. It's thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for uh, your very interesting speech. And being German myself, of course, Germany was mentioned prominently. And one of the things I wanted to uh, recall is, of course, it wasn't due to negotiations with the government, but rather because the people stormed the barriers, so to say, in the barricades. And I wonder if you can say a couple of words about, because it's very difficult for us to gauge that, what the mood is inside the country, or is there any uh, any reaction at all, you know, to, to the government uh, of the DPRK. But being, uh, sorry, being Angela Kane and disarmament, I also wanted to ask about the nuclear question that my colleague Alexander has just raised. And uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, issues that I wanted to mention is that, of course, tomorrow we will have a very important uh, seating, uh, sitting of the Security Council on 1540. How worried do we need to be that the nuclear material is being sold into hands of terrorists, because there's always a uh, monetary incentive that is very, very strong. And I think that is something that I find very worrisome. And with the second regard is with regard to the possible nuclear testing. I remember last time the uh, North Korea actually notified uh, the authorities to say, yes, we will. Of course, they called it a satellite, but still, they haven't done it this case. But we were, uh, frankly, very concerned that this could possibly happen to coincide with the NPT PrepCom that's currently going on. And we only have two more days to go or three more days to go. So how do you see the chances for this to happen in the very near future? Thank you very much, Angela. Very good questions. Then we will move to the lady over there. Yes, Rhonda Haubin, and I'm uh, a blog columnist at Zeitung for tats.de. And my question is about the a bit of the past. From 2000 to 2008, there was a, a negotiation going on between South Korea and North Korea. And there were three principles that North Korea and South Korea at the time agreed to, which is one, that the unification be by the Koreas themselves, not involve the international community, that it be peaceful, and that it be encouraging national unity. What happened to this that I know under the the next government, it, it, it fell apart, but I wondered what your government's position is towards those principles, since those were principles both Koreas agreed to. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question, or those questions. Uh, do, do I see any more hands here? Uh, I see many. Can we go to the gentleman over there? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm ambassador of Kazakhstan to the United Nations, and I would uh, very welcome to you, and it's very 
I have privilege to be here at International Peace Institute, our long-standing partner. And I can't resist temptation to inform you that 100 Koreans, Koreosaram in Kazakhstan already dancing, tango, maybe in Gangnam style, <laughs> or <laughs> Chonje Chon and many others. So, and there is, a, and they are living in peace and harmony there and contributing enormously to the multi-ethnic, multi-confessional peace and accord. And another temptation is that a few moments ago, and high representative was uh, modest enough, and she's a very humble person, but also with the assistant of the United Nations, but most first and foremost, P5 and Central, five Central Asian republics. We witnessed a few moments ago across the street the signing of so-called protocol on negative security insurance, assurance to the treaty on non of uh, uh, non-nuclear weapons zone in Central Asia. I believe this is quite a vivid example and P5 and Central Asian Republic uh, have indeed set up a fine example also in the context of the uh, policies and diplomacy related to the NPT. And I'm also, of course, happy to announce it here at International Peace Institute, with which we are pursuing all these noble goals almost two decades maybe already. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for making those very important points. And I saw a couple of hands. I think we will take the two last. Uh, there's a gentleman in the, at the back there. Oh, thank you. Hello, my name is Martin. I'm with the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, Mr. Minister, thank you so much for coming. I have a question regarding the um, Reconciliation Fund. As you know, for Germany, it was very important to have a, have a, a fund in place with which they could uh, fund, you know, some uh, some projects in the in the poorer parts of the country to help them, you know, develop a bit further. And I was wondering if Korea has been taking steps to, you know, set up a, a fund uh, like this. Uh, f that will greatly aid in the reconciliation and the development uh, of the poorer regions once uh, unification uh, comes to pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Then the very last question to the lady at the very back. Thank you, Minister. Sang Wan Yoon from Bloomberg News. Uh, you mentioned that for North Korea, having nuclear weapons is a rationale for the regime's survival, and they've declared it in their constitution. So what are you doing exactly to change the regime's calculus when for them the utmost priority is maintaining the regime's survivability, which I guess you can draw a parallel to North Korea's ally, Syria, and the Assad regime as well. And also, uh, what kind of picture are you drawing for the North Koreans in terms of the alternative that they could see when they do denuclearize? I mean, what would a government look like? Would the regime still survive? And I ask this question because the UN Committee on Inquiry is calling for referral of Kim Jong-un for human rights violations to the ICC and et cetera. So if you could elaborate, thank you. Thank you very much, then uh, famous, well, famous last words. Okay, a long list of questions. Thank you very much for your offer to help uh, uh, our efforts to resolve this nuclear question. As you know, the. Uh, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, is very knowledgeable of this uh, North Korean question and North Korean nuclear question. When he was a foreign minister, I was deputy foreign minister under him, so <laughs> we worked together. So now uh, I think uh, his uh, uh, role, uh, direct or indirect, uh, will be very useful, uh, but that would be in, uh, in concert with uh, what's, been, uh, uh, what's being done uh, through the efforts of the six-party nuclear talks. Uh, there are already uh, some efforts being done, so uh, perhaps uh, we can, uh, you could uh, watch the, uh, what we are doing uh, closely and uh, also we, we, if we need the, uh, the, your advice and counsel, certainly uh, uh, we will coordinate with your office. And there are many ways you can uh, help us. Uh, so uh, I think uh, there will be a time, there will be, certainly there will be a time for UNSG and your secretariat will, be, will play a very crucial role. We have, very, have a very crucial role in, in many different ways. I will ask specify what that uh, important roles will be in the future. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the question from our German uh, the, uh, colleague, uh, the, 
You know, unlike uh, the uh, East Germans before unification or even before the collapse of the Berlin Wall, there seems to be no uh, visible resistance or complaints on the part of North Korean population because for the last uh, seven decades, North Korea is a totally regimented society. No real voices, no public opinion, no organized party, no organized societies. So that means that they, haven't, they can now assemble a large people to have candlelight demonstrations like in East Germany. It's not possible in North Korea. But nevertheless, there are some changes. For example, now the, uh, the more than uh, 200, 2 million cellular phones are now possessed by North Koreans, even though they do not have access to the outside world. But nevertheless, more than 2.5 million cellular phones, that is a huge number compared with the uh, past years. And also, they have some markets, informal markets in Pyongyang and in other parts of the North Korea. Uh, that means that uh, uh, the distribution system uh, under the North Korean uh, government is not working. So uh, the general public in North Korea has to uh, rely on their own uh, 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 living uh, by selling their products, uh, farming products, uh, through this informal market, and there is a proliferation of informal markets in North Korea as well. And uh, regarding the uh, uh, 1540 uh, the committee, you know, uh, just last month, actually late March, we had a very interesting uh, summit in the, at The Hague. This is a very interesting summit in the sense that uh, there was a simulation, simulation uh, exercise involving all the leaders. <laughs> Regarding this subject, in the case of any, uh, the, any the, uh, transfer of nuclear materials to, for example, to a, any terrorist, and that those terrorists uh, use that at the Wall Street, then what will be the response is each capital, each leader. So each leader made his own response to that uh, scenario. Uh, I do not think this scenario is such a scenario. I think uh, this could be a reality as well. So for example, you know, we are very much very reminded of this uh, uh, AQ Khan's story many years ago, right? There's a big network of black market, you know, profiteers who are drawing from this AQ Khan's expertise on uh, nuclear missile uh, know-how. So if there is another network like this AQ Khan, Dr. AQ Khan, then it could be uh, the terrorists from Asia, terrorists from Middle East, or wherever, right? So still, uh, there is a real possibility of uh, nuclear materials uh, to be uh, to fall into the wrong hands of uh, 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 the uh, terrorists and others. And uh, now we are at the uh, concluding stage of MPT. So if uh, there is another nuclear testing uh, uh, by North Korea, uh, that could uh, uh, send the finishing blow to the efforts of NPT PEPCOM. So this is why I, I'm calling on the uh, NPT members to send a very strong message to North Korea not to do this nuclear testing once and for all. And uh, this, uh, yes, uh, why South Korea is not sticking to previous understanding uh, under the previous administrations? Uh, not really. Actually, you know, uh, throughout the all previous administrations, the one uh, uh, consistent principle uh, between the two uh, uh, Korea is that we have to resolve the inter-Korean issues through our consultation, inter-Korean dialogue. Uh, that is almost always there. Uh, what, what, what I wish to add uh, to, to that uh, approach is that uh, this inter-Korean dialogue is, not, is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. So we need uh, the uh, cooperation from the international community. After all, nuclear question is not an inter-Korean question. This is an international problem involving NPT and the security of the region, security of the world. So, so we have to uh, uh, take a two-pronged approach, inter-Korean dialogue as well as the multilateral approach through UN Security Council as well as six-party talks. And... Uh, Yes, in Kazakhstan, I, I, uh, we are, Kazakhstan is a very important strategic partner for Korea. 
Uh, I like Gangnam Style. I can dance Gangnam Style here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, nuclear free zone involving many countries uh, can work in certain uh, parts of the world, like in your region, in Latin America, in Southeast, uh, in Southeast Asia. In Korea, already uh, two Koreas have agreed uh, to make this peninsula a nuclear weapons free zone almost 20 years ago. But North Korea unilaterally uh, denunciated that uh, agreement. And then now they say they are no longer by, uh, bound by that declaration agreement. And they are now saying that they are nuclear weapon state. They will not change ever this commitment. This is their public statement and their legal commitment. So uh, even though we are ready to make this peninsula uh, nuclear weapons free, and this is what my president said at the Hague. He, she said she wants to see the peninsula become a nuclear weapons free uh, region, as President Obama said at the Pro through Prague speech. But it's North Korea that is not it, it is against uh, that idea. And uh, from the question regarding question from our UN uh, OCHA, uh, yes. Uh, in case we are uh, unified uh, again, uh, certainly uh, we can uh, learn some lessons from uh, Germany, either through uh, their special uh, the approach or through the reconciliation fund. But whatever it is called, we recognize the need for some kind of uh, financial assistance or fund uh, can be uh, utilized or mobilized to help uh, the people in the a more disadvantaged part of North Korea. Uh, that is very, uh, very clear. Uh, but that requires uh, not just the South Korean efforts, but also international efforts. Uh, I think that's where our, our uh, UN Secretariat could help, uh, together with the OCHA and other UN humanitarian agencies, uh, uh, work together. Regarding a question from our Bloomberg colleague, uh, yes, uh, the uh, uh, the their calculation, their calculus is quite different. They have a totally different game plan, right? How to change their mindset? Very difficult, very tough. So our fundamental approach is this. Yes, as long as you rely on the nuclear weapons programs and WMD programs or asymmetric uh, threats, then we, South Korea, together with our partners, together with the Security Council, will make the cost of having having these nuclear weapons very, very high, very, very heavy, so that that could backfire to the regime, the survival of the regime. So that, that is their choice. Former the uh, republics in, uh, uh, in, in the world who we used to have the nuclear weapons uh, didn't collapse, not because they do not have nuclear weapons, but because their policy failed. Right? This is the main reason why they collapsed. So plutonium, I still remember the very famous uh, remarks by Colin Powell. You cannot eat plutonium. Okay? You have to spend your scarce resources for the well-being of your people. I think this is the same advice I wish to uh, convey to my North Korean counterparts. Uh, any alternative to nuclear weapons? Yes, yes. Uh, one of my favorite uh, 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 quote is that, uh, yes, replace these pro, uh, nuclear weapons with the pro shares. Yes, pro shares. We are ready, South Koreans are ready to help North Koreans because, after all, they are our compatriots. We do not wish to fight on the friendly side of the war, which killed millions of people. We do not wish to repeat that same mistake. So uh, the sooner the better, right? We have to, we wish to, uh, wish to see North Korea abandon nuclear weapons programs and revert all these scarce resources to use for their population. Then I think, yeah, I completed uh, my uh, answers, yes. CUI, yes, CUI, you know, you are very aware of that, yes, okay. 
Mr. Minister, uh, listening to you and watching you tangoing with other, our other guests here so masterfully and so elegantly uh, leaves me with a difficult choice of finding words to thank you. But I, want to, I, I think what comes to my mind first is thanking you for being so open-hearted with us. And I would also say to mm. tango so warm-heartedly with our other participants here. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Peter Drucker. Um, uh, who said that the best way to, um, to predict the future is to shape it. I have one prediction. You will shape that future Thank you. with your noble mission of a nuclear-free peninsula and a unified Korea. You. you have not only been inspiring, but it, you have been inspiringly convincing. Good luck to you and thank you. Thank you very much.